We have about 30 seconds before one o'clock. So I mean, one o'clock, I'm sorry, <laughs> until the two o'clock hour. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce you guys. Um, today, our per wonderful presenters are, are Miss um, Omotayo, who's from Harris, and Miss um, Delexia, but I call her Miss Allen. Um, <laughs> okay, either one. <laughs> either one, right? Um, yeah. who's bilingual and I just found out this year because I busted in her library and she was speaking fluent Spanish to the kids. So I'm going to get her to become a bilingual teacher. Um, <laughs> but we are so excited. Thank you, participants. We're very excited to have you. It's the last session. Thank you for hanging in there um, all day. And I know you're going to receive some great, great uh, planning ideas to um, to have that proactive attitude and to really prepare. And so we're excited for you to uh, join us in proactive planning prevents poor performance. We welcome you and we welcome our wonderful presenters. All right, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Miss Amatayo. As I was introduced, I'm from Harris Elementary School here in Aldine. And once again, I'm Miss Allen or Galaxia. They both work. I respond to everything and anything with the sound in it. <laughs> um, so welcome. And we're excited that you are here with us this last session of this wonderful conference. We are going to begin by talking about our, um, going over our cubs. And I know it's been a long day, but if there's any brave person out there who would like to read um, the no for us, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay, I'll go for you. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I see it, Ms. Giles, go ahead, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we will know the process of providing effective literacy instruction. We will understand the importance of proactively planning for effective <clears throat> literacy instruction. And we will, we will be able to prevent poor literacy instruction. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you so much, Ms. Giles. So let us get right into it with proactive planning. All students deserve effective literacy instruction. So I'd like for you guys to take maybe about the next 30 seconds. Ms. Allen, you can go, go ahead. I would like for you guys to take about the next 30 seconds to just Look at this, observe the image, and think about how does this image resonate with you? We're gonna break out into a quick session, a quick small group session, just to share our thoughts, but let's take the next 30 seconds to just look at the image and think about how it resonates with you first. Okay, so if we could please have our participants broken into groups at this time for them to collaborate on their thoughts. I think. Miss, what? Okay.
All righty. Let's give everyone a few more minutes to trickle back in. We have just about everybody in. Okay, so is there a brave soul that would like to share their thoughts with us? What resonated with you with this image? Okay. Anyone? You know, I have the patience of an elementary school teacher, so I have wait time. I don't know. Sometimes it reminds me that like this might have been how possibly we were once teaching like, hey, I taught it to the whole class. I'm sure they got it. But, you know, there was no real quick assessment afterwards in their groups or anything like that to really kind of tell you. I'm trying to remember from when I was a kid and when I first started teaching, like what it was really like, you know, you knew kids didn't get it, but and kind of just moved along and figured, well, I hope they caught up later. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Someone also added in the chat, no checking for understanding. In our group, that was also brought up and mentioned. Is there anyone else adding anything in the chat? No. So thank you guys so much for sharing. It is important that we intentionally prepare for the meaningful learning that all students are going to receive and understanding the process of preparing for that effect, effective instruction can truly support with that. And checking for understanding is definitely a part of that process. So what is the process to ensure effective literacy instruction is happening and why is it important? The process is actually auditing the curriculum and instructional alignment. So within your respective districts or campuses that you may be with, the exact curriculum that you may be using is, 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 excuse me, is definitely aligned to the framework within your district. So that process is not only a part of the ownership from the teachers, but a lot of times teachers begin to get overwhelmed thinking that leading students to effective and student learning happens only within the classroom. The stakeholders are not only the teachers. So the district is a part of it. The um, curriculum that is being used within the district being in alignment is one step in the first beginning process step to help the teachers make sure that they're aligned. Establishing and <clears throat> having a data collection process for student performance is the next part of that process. And the last portion is conducting campus-based instructional rounds and providing timely and intentional feedback. So right now we're just going to briefly go over these bullet points, but in the next few minutes, we're going to dive deeper into that and what that looks like within our respective campuses and on our in our districts and classrooms. So the importance of ensuring that we have effective literacy instruction happening is to meet the ultimate goal of reaching that whole student. So the importance of literacy instruction is, as we know, to build students' comprehension and writing skills and overall skills and communication and really supporting that whole child with their thinking process as well. So I'd like to leave us with a quote to think about before we move into our next slide. And that's effective literacy instruction provides explicit systematic instruction and opportunities to practice applying new skills. So we can move forward. So when planning for explicit systematic literacy instruction, that really includes setting objectives. Consistently setting and learning, consistently setting learning objectives that are specific but not restrictive. Meaning we know that we have those students who may be on level during that time, but what are we doing to differentiate and meet the needs of all students? So preparing, looking at the lesson, internalizing and preparing with that frame of mind truly will make sure that we meet the learning needs of all students. Communicating the learning objectives to students throughout the lesson. That was something that was mentioned in my small group uh, breakout session just a few minutes ago, actually, 
of making sure that we're setting objectives. And by the end of the lesson, we're asking the students, are they meeting the objectives? And we're checking in with their understanding, but are we truly doing that throughout the entire lesson? Sometimes we may look at an objective as a compliance piece to make sure that we have it stated, but objectives truly lean and help students understand not only to take accountability of their own learning, but also to set learning goals so that they understand the process of which the, what they're learning and the importance of it. Also connecting the learning objectives to previous and future learning helps to ensure that students, again, can take their ownership into an accountability of their own learning. And lastly, engaging students in setting personal learning objectives. Because at the end of the day, our objective is not only to teach the student a specific content, but to help build a whole child holistically to be future leaders and learners. So to the right here, we've attached what our district use, uses as objectives. We use CUBS, which stands for knows, understands, and will be able to. Whatever district you may be coming from or representing, regardless of how the format is set up, it is truly important that you set a learning objective and goal for your students to understand and communicate that importance of that learning lesson throughout the entire lesson to those students. So as we set learning goals and objectives, Throughout the lesson, there are certain things and key preparation pieces that we can ensure are happening to make sure that we're guiding our students to make sure that they are understanding the learning for that day. So opportunities to practice applying those new skills will happen through cues, questions, and advanced organizers. Do I have a volunteer who can read the cues um, portion for us, please? Provide hints for the students about the content of the lesson. Thank you. So cues providing the hints for the students about the content for the lesson. That's meaning that we are intentionally setting specific modeling through um, hints, through visuals, through different ways to help students to understand the content of the lesson, not necessarily giving them the answer, but guiding them and probing them in a specific intentional way. Do I have a volunteer to read the questions portion? Questions. <laughs> Provide teachers with the opportunity to assess what students know or don't know. And that's that check in for understanding. Thank you so much for reading that. That's that check in for understanding. Oftentimes we think we just check for the understanding at the beginning and the end. But research shows that checking for understanding every five to seven minutes throughout the lesson ensures that our students are aligned and on track to understanding the objective by the end of the lesson. And lastly, can I have a volunteer to read the advanced organizers portion? No worries, I will read it. Advanced organizers should provide a conceptual framework to help students organize concepts and instructional materials. So to sum it up, using cues, questions, and advanced organizers will help students focus their learning on the objective by motivating them and tapping their curiosity and interests. And interest, excuse me. And also, higher order thinking questions and critical skills can help students develop their knowledge within whatever their particular literacy le lessons objective is for that day. So we need to be intentional to get students to reach their learning objective. And we can do this by planning for various levels of questions that leads them to their target. So we're gonna take the next three minutes to dive a little deeper in your breakout rooms. You all are going to collaborate with your group and after you collaborate, answer the question on your designated slide. Please be ready to share when we return. So Ms. Allen, if you could share the actual presentation with the participants in the chat so they're able to type in on the slides that correlates to their room number. 
I, I will. Give me just a moment. No worries. Thank you so much. No problem. I'll go ahead and start the breakout rooms and then I'll share it. Well, no, let me share it in the chat first. Hold on just a second. Okay. So as you're sharing it, I'll go through the questions for each room. Let me share my screen. All right, so for those of us who will be in breakout room number one, your question is, and everyone has a um, sentence frame to help us to frame our question, our response. So how is conducting consistent campus-based instructional rounds helpful to ensuring effective literacy instruction? So that's for our room number one participants. Room number two, um, how is establishing a data collection process for student performance important when ensuring effective literacy instruction for all students? Room number three, when does planning for effective literacy instruction take place? Briefly describe the planning process and who's involved. Room number four, what does effective instruction, literacy instruction look like in the classroom, the students, and with um, on the campus as well? Room number five, how does consistently setting objectives prepare students for effective literacy instruction? And room number six, and let me know, Ms. Allen, if we don't need this many rooms. I'll take one of the slides off. How I don't think we, we don't know, because we only have 17 participants. So I think five rooms should be enough. Okay, so we can stop at six, five. Yes. All righty, so we're ready for our groups. And we'll be popping in just to support you all if you guys have any questions or, you know, you have a brain fart because it is Saturday. Thank you guys so much again for joining. You know, let's just do four rooms. Okay. Let's do four. All right. Okay, let me delete that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, how much time do you want them to have? About five minutes? Um, I think let's do three. Three, it's all right. Well, yeah. we'll reconvene at 224 because I'll start to close in mid 223. Okay. All right. I moved one of the participants from room one to room four because no one had joined that room. Okay. You're on mute, but I think I could, I only put, I, <laughs> I read what I, know. I saw. <laughs> I noticed that I was saying, I saw you're awesome because I'm over here trying to manipulate and go back and forth. 
Yeah, I was like, I don't think I'm going to go back and forth. I'm just going to watch the rooms. You can pop in. You'll pop in. I'll watch it because I can kind of see who's active. Room one is like an inactive room. So we'll just focus on two, three, and four. Okay, perfect. So I should probably just delete slide one because there's nobody there. You could leave it, but we just want, we'll just go through it. We'll just skip it and go straight to two. Okay. Right. give me just a second i'm going to have to blow my nose because you know i'm fighting sign pop in I'm going to start to close the rooms. Can you add another probably um, like minute or is it too late? You're on me. Hi, no, excuse me. I got disconnected. Can I get back into my room? I was in room. Um, oh, Lord, I, I want to say we were talking about effective literacy. So wh whichever one that is, you know, like what what does effective literacy look like? Uh, room number four. OK, thank you. Well, I, I closed thank the room, so we're, we're just going to reconvene. Oh, okay? OK, thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, it was mid sentence when I got cut off. I was like, wait a minute, I was talking. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. No, that's okay. Well, no. Thank well, feel you. free to feel free to add in any of your um pieces or thoughts when we get to that slide if you like. Okay, thank you so much. No worries. All right. So we're are you ready, Miss O? Yes. Is everyone back? Uh yes, ma'am. All righty, so we're going to go straight to slide two. And if room number two would please come off of mute and share your thoughts with us, why is establishing a data collection process for student performance important when ensuring effective literacy instruction for all students? So our group um, decided to. Um, answer the question um, by saying establishing a data collection process for student performance supports effective literacy instruction. So basically that data becomes a resource and you will use that data resource to plan for intentional specific instructional strategies. Um, and you want to embed um, instructional strategies that will differentiate based on those specific targeted needs. And then the second person, um, they wrote that use a lot, utilizing that data creates a baseline to work with. And so when you use that baseline, you're allowing the, the teacher to see the area of focus for their students. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ms. Giles, for sharing. Did anyone else want to add on to why establishing a data collection process is imp important to preparing for effective literacy instruction? Um, I can jump in. Um, just thinking about data. So we all know data is super de duper important. That's what drives your instruction. That's what uh, you go back and check for the root causes. That is what uh, helps the teacher um, plan their reteach. And not only that, that's definitely a great way of checking for understanding how you pull your small groups, how you create your small groups. Oh my God, I can go on and on. But um, data definitely uh, makes makes the teachers aware of where their students are and how to uh, push them to the next level. Um, I, I mean, it's like the the foundation. Uh, I cannot move forward until I see how my students perform. Even when you just get these these babies the first month, you have to have a, some type of assessment 
set in place so you can start understanding how to create your instruction and plan intentionally um, as you're internalizing that curriculum so you'll know how to um, you know how to implement it effectively. So, I mean, I can go on and on about that, a girl. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That was awesome. It was spot on. Let's move on to breakout room number three. I know a lot of us didn't get an opportunity to actually type on the slides because of timing. So please feel free to share out. Um, just unmute. Feel free. This is a welcome space. It's a safe space. Share out your learning. So number three, when does planning for effective literacy instruction take place? Briefly describe the planning process and who's involved. Okay, so I know I talk a lot, but I'm gonna jump that back in there. <laughs> so I was in breakout room three and I really hope that my peers in there would chime in um, because we were getting in the groove and then we got snatched back like this body snapping. But, <laughs> but Planning for effect, effective literacy instruction, just any instruction, guys, um, we hope that it takes place in PLC according to that master schedule. Um, and if your time allows it during your conference time, and as um, some of the uh, peers stated in, uh, in the breakout room, at home, and sometimes, you know, we have to, we have to plan at home. Sometimes we got to plan on the weekend. Right now, I'm planning for a training next week as I'm getting trained by you guys. So that's effective um, planning. And it's intentional planning because you want to make sure before you get in that before you get in front of the kiddos that you know what you're talking about and you've already understood the misconceptions. Now, yeah. who's all a part of that? Uh, is definitely your grade level peers. But hey, how about this? How about all levels? Because it's a vertical alignment. We want to make sure sixth grade. Uh, knows what seventh grade is doing seventh grade knows what eighth grade is doing because we're building those skills and of course you know you have your tier two or your literacy coach however if they are unable to be a part of that planning because you know god knows they get pulled left and right where you have your peers to uh, coming together to have that poc to bounce off those ideas and plan effectively internalizing that curriculum again and um thinking about what's the best uh, best practices to implement in the classroom? Yes, ma'am. I have to give you snaps. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Would anyone else like to add on from group three? I think, um, um, I think Autumn, yeah, she gave um, some really good points on what we should do. Um, as a first year teacher, we do run into um, having to work from home because we're pulled in so many directions and sometimes we don't have time to um, get together, even as a team, sometimes on our conference time. And we try to get as much done as we can in our meetings. Um, but it's still sometimes a, um, a struggle, but, but we do get to experience when everybody participates, it is a smooth process. Yes, ma'am. And I would also like to add, um, not only for first year teachers, just how education has evolved now, everyone has to work at home. Because just as chefs are cooking in the kitchen, they also have to go get the groceries before they start cooking. And so that planning is not only going to take place in the class at campus or on campus, it has to take place outside of the classroom. And as I was stating at the beginning, it's not only solely on the teachers, it has to be from the top to the bottom, from our principals, our assistant principals, our specialists, our educators those who are pulling students, even parents at home. It's a full community. All stakeholders are responsible for helping us to plan. Just as I mentioned earlier about having consistent instructional rounds. If leadership teams are not having instructional consistent rounds happening, how are teachers effectively implementing feedback that's received from those rounds to move forward and to help their students? In a, from a lens that they are not used to seeing on an everyday basis. So just as Autumn said, and just as Marion said, yes, all hands are on deck during this time. 
and it takes place at home. It takes place during your planning sessions. It takes place even during the time that you guys are dedicating right now to come on a Saturday. That shows how dedicated you are to your craft. It shows that you are truly invested in your students having a um, intentional lesson plan for them. Yes, passion, and I love it. And our last group, group four. What does effective literacy instruction look like? You guys didn't get a chance to actually type, but please feel free to unmute and share. What does it look like in the classroom? What is this? What are the students doing? What are the teachers doing? And what does it look like as a campus in a whole? For me, um, the students are engaged and I'm facilitating. That's how I know my kids are learning what I'm teaching and they are teaching their friends what they're learning. And I'm just, sorry, mosing around, helping out, giving advice. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and can, can I just add, because I'm, I'm the one that got cut off. <laughs> you know, and, and, and came back. But one of the other things that we were talking in that break room uh, number four was really about effective literacy a lot that we're, we're really talking about, at least in my district, you know, th that you have those components of structured literacy in place, you know, from really starting uh, with children from all the way from phonological awareness and working your way through until they get to a comprehension level and really making sure we're, we're hitting all of those areas that we need to, to ensure that readers really have all the skills they need, you know, to get to that final level of comprehension, you know. So it's just having those things in all those building blocks in place and making sure you really have everything. Yes, ma'am, I fully agree with both of you, with Ms. Nikita um, speaking on facilitating as you're facilitating, guiding, you're modeling. And from what I'm hearing you say, you're modeling and your students are receptive to it and they're able to teach their peers. That's peer collaboration. So that shows student ownership and student learning and engagement in that classroom. And even knowing and being aware of the actual curriculum and the science of reading to know that there are levels to understanding how to read from phonemic awareness up to comprehension. So yes, we are, y'all are spot on it. Love it. Love the learning today. So that concludes my portion. So we're going to move forward now with preventing poor performance. You're on mute. I was saying if I could get my computer to act right. Okay, so here we go, ladies and ladies. I'm not. I don't think I saw a gentleman's name, so um, I'm gonna move a little quicker. I did have some breakout sessions planned, but we're just gonna continue with the whole group because I really appreciate your 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 participation. You ladies are awesome. Um, so we're gonna go into three key points to ponder when you're thinking about preventing poor performance. And I keep clicking my arrow, but it's just not working. So some things. Three things that I want us to think about when we want to focus on preventing poor performance, because you guys are, like Ms. O was saying, spot on with the planning, but we want to look at the other side of it. So there are three things that you can do, and those are connection, environment, and reflection. And when I say connection, environment, and reflection, I want to think, I want you, to, we're going to go beyond um, the connection that we're used to seeing, right? So taking time to authentically connect with your students with our connections. When it comes to environment, consider your classroom design and your classroom setup and how it affects your students' process skills. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then reflecting on your practice. And I know these are some things that you've heard a lot, but I wanted to take them and look at them from a different perspective today. So when we start to think about and talk about connection. Um, I went to this book that has kind of been like my go-to for about the past year or two, but it has some excellent information in it on when we connect with our students. So when we're talking about connection, this is more than an SEL time. Um, this is you taking the time to really get to know your students and where they come from. And there are, <clears throat> and I'm gonna pull out my book here because I wanna make sure I say my, use my information correctly. In her book, she talks about the ready for rigor framework and how when we're talking about connecting with our students, we look at that from four different areas. And those areas are awareness, of their culture, 
And she talks about three levels of culture. And those three levels are surface culture, which is kind of what we what we do a lot of. Not saying that that's a bad thing. You know, it's Black History Month. We're going to have Black History dinners. We were dressed up in Aldean, you know, this past, the past two Fridays with our African attire or the color Black. So those are all great things. But we go beyond that and we go deeper. And then the next one it talks about is shallow culture. And that's knowing those unspoken rules of a culture. And we have to think our district has a lot of students who speak Spanish as their first language, but not all of our students come from the same Spanish speaking countries. So we have to really think about how we can authentically and really get to know our students and where they come from. And that last level of awareness with our students is deep culture. And I love the quote and I'm going to read it to you from the book. It says, this level is made up of tacit knowledge and unconscious assumptions that govern our worldview. So that's when we kind of have to go in and do that self-check, which we're going to talk about when we, when we get to reflection, but just really connecting with our students. The next level is talking about learning partnerships um, and just reimagining that student and teacher partnership where we are looking at not just the academic part of our students and how we can connect with them and work with them, but also taking the responsibility to reduce our students' socio-emotional stress. So they're able to really tap into all of the wonderful planning that we've already done, right? Um, information processing, which is just really tapping into our students' ability to think on a deeper level. And I love how she says here, how we connect new content to culturally relevant examples and metaphors from our students' community and everyday lives. That is gonna take some more planning from us, but it's gonna pay off in the long run because we'll know our students and we'll be able to connect with them. And lastly, just bringing in that community of learners and learning environment. So I know we do SEL, we have Quaver lessons, we had, um, I can't remember the other program right now, but we we do a lot with our students to get to know them and to learn about them. But when we're really going for that level of connection, we wanna take it deeper. And with that, I want us to just take a moment and do another whole group discussion. When you hear or think of connections, what comes to mind? And if we can have just one or two people share out, that'd be great. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, based on what you were sharing earlier, um, you do want to make uh connections with your students and during the planning process when you are um, making those text to self and uh, world you can kind of make that differentiation piece and include some of the things that you do know about your students and so when you are connecting with your students and getting to know them and and their families and their background that they come from, then it creates like a, a, a community inside of that classroom where it's a safe space to learn. And so exactly. again, utilizing what you know through those connections, then you're able to find ways to embed some of those interest and cultural um, information pieces into your lesson as well. So. That's what I Thank you, Ms. Giles, so much. And I'm I'm going to move on only because I'm looking at our time and we're, we're losing it. We're, leave, we're losing our time, but I'm glad that we are able to have some real conversations about our topic. And um, I just wanted us to take a moment and look at this visual. So just like Ms. Giles said, right, we're thinking about connections. And the other thing that Zaretta Hammond talks about in her book is how when we take the time to establish those connections, it's tied to our neurological processing. So that's gonna help to build our students' level of thinking and learning in our classrooms as well. And I'm I hope, and if you're not, if you're not familiar, but this is, you know, the five blind men and the elephant, right? So all of the blind men were feeling different parts of the elephant and they had different perceptions based on where they were. So when we're talking about connecting with students, I just want to make sure that I highlight what you see here, right? So the misconceptions of culturally responsive teaching um, is not for low self-esteem. It's not about social justice. It's a classroom management tool. It's a mystery. It's all about hip hop. It's a gimmick. So all of these things are misconceptions. That is what it's not. But what it is, is it's much deeper. And I know, you know, we have an hour and I'm talking fast. So feel free to um, 
look into this book by Zaretta Hammond. So I'm going to move on to our next key point to ponder, and that is environment. And when we think about environment, I purposely picked the pictures with, you know, the cool chairs and the neat seating, because when we really, really are work, excuse me, working to prevent poor performance, we want to go beyond classroom design. So I'm going to move quickly again. And I want you to look at these four, we're going to look at these four components, and I'm going to talk about them. But I am going, you all already have a copy of this presentation, and you can go back into the presenter notes, and I've linked the resources that I use to find this information. So we want, again, I was talking about um, executive functioning skills, right? So when you're planning your classroom and you're thinking about, you know, where you want to put your student desk, where you want to put, you know, your whole group place, it's a lot more than just those design components. So how can we impact our students' executive functioning? Four components, and I'm not going to read these to you. I'm just going to click through them. There's working memory. I like to give y'all time to read. Next one is organization. Then we go into task initiation. This one was a big one for me, especially being in elementary school. And then lastly, I think the one that um, we really need to focus on is inhibition. So think about these four components when organizing your classroom. So working memory, making sure we have those visuals, organization, task initiation, initiation, excuse me, and inhibition, which is just another word for self-monitoring. How have you established systems within your classroom that allow your students to be empowered to self-monitor and self-regulate? So with that, we have a short activity. Um, I want us to take a moment, and we don't have time, but we were going to break this up and just look at this visual of a classroom. And I want us to just have a really quick whole group discussion on how we could think, thinking about those four components of executive functioning for our students, how can we tweak this classroom design just a little bit or add some other components that are going to help our students in the classroom and help us with our facilitating their learning. So I'll give you some time to think and then we'll share. All right. If you have a, if anyone is just ready to come off mute and share, feel free. How could we tweak this room or improve this room? All right, I want to go to the next one. We can do that. Here's another room. Same thing. So I'll give you an example <clears throat> so we can go on and, and move on. Um, so if, I, if we're thinking about working memory, right? That's going to be creating those visuals to help our students just be able to come into the classroom and get straight to work. Um, we think of that a lot of times as more of a skill for our lower elementary students or our students with special needs. However, creating visuals is helpful for everyone. Even just think about us as adults. When we go to different places, a lot of times they have pictures to help us to be able to work through those places, right? So if we're looking here at, we have, four student tables, and then we have five student desks. So there could easily be some kind of visual, whether it's a list of materials to have with explanations for those at the tables and on the desk to help our students. When we're thinking about our task initiation, getting those students to self-regulate, I always think about what's the first thing that we can have ready for them at the door, at their desk when they come in, so they can just come in and get straight to work, right? Because giving them those abilities and equipping them to be able to get straight to work is going to help them to be able to work through all of the assignments that we've given them in our planning. I'm going to check the chat. I see a note. 
Okay, that's our the tennis form. All right, so moving on to our last piece, preventing poor performance. The last thing that I wanna talk about, and I know again, we've heard this a lot, but it is reflection. So why reflect? Reflection sep separates the ordinary from the extraordinary, and it truly does help us to improve our practice. And so there are three parts that I want us to reflect on. And those are, oops, I went too far. Um, what surprises do you go through during the day? What frustrations have you dealt with? And what failures? And I put the asterisk next to failures because I know we're talking about preventing poor performance, but we know that sometimes we're gonna plan and we're gonna execute and things are not gonna go the way that we ho hope that they would. And when that happens, it's important that we take the time to reflect on that. And I wanna share another, um, from something from you that I read. And, it, and it's something that we know, but we just need to have those reminders sometimes. So whenever you in your classroom, whenever you feel frustration, just think of that as, or any time that you experience failure, think of that as an opportunity to experience growth and to have those opportunities, right? For reflection. And so when you're thinking about reflecting, that also helps us to improve our communication skills and our problem solving skills. And a lot of times it helps us to grow in patience. Um, so those are the three areas that you should reflect on instead of those generic, you know, what am you know, how did it go today? Um, what am I happy about? Not that there's anything wrong with those things, but we want to be strategic even in our reflecting so that we're able to do our best work. And I forgot to share because I'm moving fast. I'm trying to wrap this up that I read it, this comes from an article and they had a lot of top executives just discuss with them on how they reflect. And when they also, and when they analyze those executives reflections, they found that when they reflected on their surprises, their frustrations and their failures, those were the most effective areas for them that allowed them to improve their practice. So the next um, assignment for us to do was for us to take some time and reflect on our work this past week. Um, and I guess it's 2.49. So I'm gonna let the music play for like another minute or two and you can just do a quick reflection, something that surprised you, something that frustrated you or something that you felt as though was a failure and reflect on that. And then we're gonna go on and wrap up our session this afternoon. Do you mind if I jump in? Not at all. Um, so <clears throat> I'm no longer in the classroom, but I'm a forever teacher. Uh, with my role, I'm a district um, curriculum implementation manager for Houston ISD for ELA and social studies. And so when we thinking about the word planning, what surprised me is that, <laughs> what surprised me was that teachers, um, really forgot that, you know, best practices is to plan intentionally, is to internalize your lesson. You cannot get up in the morning, stretch your arms and say, okay, I'm gonna dive in this lesson and call it a day. You cannot do that. I don't understand. You cannot do that. So we, we walk them through the process and we show them how to internalize and what thinking looks like using a protocol, you know, uh, it was more, it was, it was the it was a question of, well, when I'm gonna have a time to do that? Well, you have someone child in front of you. You're gonna have to make time to do that. I have a 16, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, now he's 17. Oh my God, he's mm -hmm. 17 years old now. Mm -hmm. And so I want the teacher in front of my baby to come prepare for him, you know? So I have to make sure I'm prepared for my students when I was in a classroom. On my level, I have to come prepare for my, my admin and my teachers when I train them. And right. the frustration is that it's like, please understand that's best practices. This is old school, good old teaching, you know, this mm -hmm. is best practices. And so then when I reflect on my practice and in my role, my fair, my failures were, okay, I am stretched so many ways. When am I going to go in and model more behaviors of intentional planning? What does that look like from beginning to end, from the do now to the exit ticket? What does that look like? And so I'm reflecting on that. And my focus before the year is out is to dive in those classrooms and teachers allow me 
to do more of the modeling of what effective and intentional planning looks like because it's going to be implemented in that classroom with their students, not to add that with teachers, but with their students. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's all good. I, I, I mean, it is, it's, a, I like how you just tied it all in. You literally like summed up our, tra our whole presentation for us. <laughs> so I do appreciate that. Well, ma'am, I've been having a ball in here. You just don't realize. I'm like, yes. Come good. on now, y'all. Come on. I'm good, trying to good. get my coaches like, y'all better get in this training. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad. Good, good. We're, we're, we're yeah. glad that we were able to help. Oh, um, and I got to say, I'm from Aldine. I just have to throw that in there. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh -oh. Aldine. Okay. <laughs> we're from Aldine, too, as you saw. Yes, so. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Very much so. All right, guys. Um. So we are going to, like we said, we shared this with you already. So you have all of our notes. Um, please feel free to reach out to us. Of course, there's the Q&A. Um, we were able to, in this session, um, provide, let me look at my, provide, um, you are, hopefully you all now know the process of providing effective literary instruction. Just give us a thumbs up or something to show us that you do. Um, that you have been able to understand the importance of proactively planning for effective literacy instruction and that our goal when you leave out of here is you're going to take these practices and these procedures that we've shared with you all to help you prevent poor literacy instruction. Um, again, we really do appreciate your time this afternoon. We know everybody has a lot going on. Um, thank you to those familiar faces Thank you and, and names. And thank you also to those unfamiliar faces and names that we hope will become familiar um, in the time to come. So again, um, that's me. Y'all see, I was like, I couldn't find any pictures. That's me, you know, taking one of those rare selfies in my classroom. So thank you all for everything. Yes, thank you guys so much for joining. Um, I forgot to mention at the beginning, Please share out your learning using the hashtag literacy matters and tag us in your learning. We are going to give one lucky participant a gift card. Whoever tags us the most with their learning from today on Twitter, we're going to check whoever we have the most tags from. You guys will win a gift certificate. So please, please, please tweet out using the hashtag sharing your learning from today. And I did want to briefly go through, because uh, Ms. Allen, you did have some people share out some of their Right, I was just trying to look through those. Thank you. Go ahead. Did, did you want to read it? Uh, you can. Oh, okay. So, um, Nikita said a surprise was a new bottom bean writing template that her CIC introduced. Her students enjoyed using the template and then produced more detailed writing. Awesome, because we all know our students struggle with writing, so that's a big surprise. Kudos to you. Um, Ms. Yvette said, it's difficult for teachers to find time to plan when they have to prepare for a snapshot of planning. Or I do now looking for um look back look at PLC as a coach I empathize empathize for teachers and all that's expected of them and what we want to call planning time definitely agree Miss uh, Delgado we briefly spoke about now with the evolution of education and the new process of, of how students learn, we have to prepare outside of school. So we definitely agree with that. Miss Garza said a surprise was widely being able to demonstrate how STR supports comprehension. It is important teachers remember that effectively literacy, effectively literacy requires all the pillars of the literacy instruction. Definitely, definitely agree. I concur. I really that. like Wiley's presentation today. It was, it was excellent. So thank you guys so much again for joining. That concludes our session. Again, fill out the um, attendance forms that are both linked. One is for myself and Ms. Allen. The other is for the actual Literacy Matters Conference. So please take the time to fill out both of those. And we'll be looking forward to your feedback, guys. Thank you so much. I hope that this was a very informative session and have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank You're you guys welcome. for coming. Miss um, Allen, you motivated Miss Delgado to read their book. It's a good book. Thank you. It was great. I loved it. Thank, Thank you, Miss Delgado.
Ms. Mercy, you want me to go ahead and shut down, lead the session? Miss Allen, before we leave the session, can you pull up our uh, presentation so we can take a little picture? Oh, yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Let me see. I don't even see me. Um, hold on. Let me, let me, let me. Uh, let she me says see. she's still in another session, so we okay. can just, we can end it once we take our picture. Hold on. Okay, there we go. I got your face to mine. Okay, hold on. Trying to. You ready? Okay, yeah. I was trying to hide those participants. Okay. Are we throwing up our ones? Oh, girl, what did I just do? Look at me. Hold on. <laughs> oh, you and, know what? Let's go, let's go to let me. Find, which slide do you want on there? The first one? Yeah, probably the first one. Yeah, let me go to the first one. Here we go. Okay, you ready? Let's take one of that one and of the second one. Okay. I'm over here recording. I'm trying did to you get it. <laughs> okay. They gonna watch our clip and be like, they're so silly. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. Okay. You ready for the next one? I haven't even taken one yet, but um. All right. You ready? Okay. I'm ready. Hold All on. right. This, because this is like in front of my face on this one. So let me put it in the middle. Ta da! You, so Thank you you should just take it and send it to me because I'm struggling over here. Okay, here we go. On three. One, two, three. All right, one more. Just because. One, two, three. All right. <laughs> Let's see what Miss what Miss Mercer said. She said she's in another session. No, well, I, I, I finally finished. Oh, uh, okay, I was getting oh, ready to okay. go. The other I thought I was just gonna kind of man her chat, but she couldn't share her screen. So I ended up having to share the screen and then you couldn't hear the video. So then I had to unshare. We were, she needed me more than you guys. Y'all, you were organized. So y'all did great. <laughs> so I appreciate you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Miss Allen, because without you, I would have been struggling like the other um, host was. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, you know, I always say teamwork makes the dream work and I really believe it so <laughs> no, y'all were great and okay. just so you know Miss Allen we are highlighting team one in the multilingual newsletter so make sure you look for that the next hey. uh next month thank you awesome. Eric, you know Miss always team <laughs> one too right <laughs> so, all right team one all righty have a good afternoon, ladies. Thank you, you too. Thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. No, thank you guys for wanting to present. We always need presenters. So don't forget seeds coming up in the summer. Well, you can we'll be at work. That you was the problem repeat. last year. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bye, lady. Bye-bye. Right. Have a good weekend.